Michael sets up uh, his computer, I'm going to introduce him. So Michael Hoffman, our tour bug speaker uh, this month, is, uh, is a local speaker uh, now, but when we invited him, he was a, an outside speaker, and he decided to move here to make it easier for us <laughs> to, to have him, and to make it cheaper for us to have him here come and speak to us. Jokes aside, uh, he, he's just joined the NCI, so we're really uh, excited to, to have him in the Toronto area and to join the, the Torbug family. Um, he uh, did his PhD with uh, Ewan Bernie, some of you may know him, uh, in uh, Cambridge, and uh, before that was in Texas. Is that where you're from originally? I'm originally from Texas. Okay, oh, nice. so we won't hold that against you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why you're enjoying the, the nice weather we're having today. I'm enjoying the nice weather and, you know, also the, the political attention. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Not here about the taxes. So yeah. For <laughs> okay, so, uh, so Michael today is going to give us a talk on the annotation of the human genome using chromatin and RNA-seq data. And uh, we really look forward to this talk and I'm sure uh, it will be uh, very nice. Actually, one other thing I, I wanted to mention. Michael and I know each other from Twitter space, actually. So Twitter, so Michael's handle, if you want to tweet about it, is uh, Michael Hoffman, at Michael Hoffman. He's <laughs> <laughs> telling me he's doing a great talk to the world. Take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis, and thank you for inviting, inviting me here. So uh, good to have this, this experience at night today. met some people who, other people I have also only known via Twitter um, up to today. So I'm going to talk, talk to you about some of the work that I did in the ENCODE project, which was, which was actually um, introduced a little in the previous talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about the ENCODE project and about a technique I developed as part of that project, which I call semi-automated genome annotation, um, and then its application to chromatin data and um, RNA-seq data, and then um, should overview of my lab will work on it. I'm going to start with this, this quotation I found uh, that I thought was really lovely from Eric Lander, the director of the probe, who was once asked to explain the genome in seven words. He said, genome, bought the book, hard to read. <laughs> I think this, this single quotation describes most of the challenge of genomics in the past 12 years or so, uh, especially human genomics, where we acquired the human genome sequence at great cost, um, and then realized that we had a lot to learn about what many parts of it actually meant and how they influenced us biologically. So the National Human Genome Research Institute, part of the, the USNIH, funded something called the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, or ENCODE project, starting with a pilot project on 1% of the human genome that was done with, with uh, very high-tech microarray experiments, and this was published back in 2007, state of the art in 1% of the human genome. And next year, I thought that this was, was worth expanding to work on the entire genome, which was now possible due to the even newer um, high-throughput sequencing techniques. And of course, some of these things that were done five years ago with the kind of infancy of large-scale use of high throughput sequencing now seem as outdated as some of the microarray stuff did a few, a few years ago. Um, but they, the ENCODE project, of which I was a part, produced um, in the, the production phase more than 40 papers, I think. And a lot of these were published in September of last year and, and soon thereafter. So in the production phase of the ENCODE project, uh, it became necessary to not treat the, the human genome as some sort of um, platonic universal quantity, but as something that is actually associated with the biology of individual cell types. And so an effort was made to focus on several particular cell types to try to do as much as possible of the experimental interrogation we did within the project. So they did things from a couple of different germ layers. You got some embryonic stem cells, various, um, various blood, red blood cell and white blood cell related cell types, um, but like things like 
Kila, uh, which I guess some people dispute whether Kila is, is actually human or should be in its own species now. Um, and things like fatocellular carcinomas. Most of these are various sorts of um, cancer cell lines because they're a lot easier to work with, but there are things like QVAT, which are, are normal cells. Um, so the experiments that were that were done, and a lot of these were were developed more fully in the process of the Infit project, fall into the category of functional genomics. So right here we have a diagram of a single chromosome, and when you zoom in through several orders of magnification, you can see all the different structures that are present in different layers. So you can see sort of supercoiling of chromatin, and then as you zoom in further, you can see how there's DNA that is wrapped around single nucleosomes and sort of feeds on a string model. And as you zoom in further, you can see the nucleosomes are made up of individual histone proteins and their transcription factor, uh, transcription factors that are bound to various bits of DNA. And if you zoom in further to the level of DNA bases, you can see that like, RNA polymerases is transcribing DNA into, into RNA. So this is kind of a lot of our, our model of, of what happens in genomics and gene regulation right here in this one picture. And we wanted to discover various things about this model. So, so one thing it, it is these uh, DNA hypersensitive sites that were, that, that were previously talked about today. So we use techniques like DNA-seq and a similar technique, FAIR-seq, uh, to try to identify sites that are regions <coughs> of open chromatin. So these regions of open chromatin are the, the regions where transcriptional machinery or other sorts of enzymes can get easier access to the DNA and actually operate it. So some of the most important things, like say uh, promoters, are often going to be associated with DNA hypersensitive sites. Another thing we're interested in is trying to figure out what sort of biomolecules are associated with the GM. So ChIP-seq allows us to get a picture of both of which transcription factors are, are bound or are present where, and also can tell us about these histones. So the histones often have covalent modifications. So they're proteins, but you know, histone three here might have its lysine four. It can have several different methylation states. So there'll be other enzymes that come along and they can methylate it or dimethylate it or trimethylate it, and that can be very important uh, for understanding how genes nearby are regulated. And finally, we did a lot of RNA-seq, which is fairly straightforward to try to get a picture of what all the, the, the collection ensemble of transcripts that are present in the cell are. And from those, we can get a model of where all the genes are, but we can also, from these other techniques, get a model of where all the cis regulatory elements, such as promoters and TF binding sites are, and also long-range um, elements, such as enhancers or, or insulators. So there are a variety of techniques here. I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about chip C because it's so important to the rest of the chromatin research I'm uh, talking about today. So in chromatin immunoprecipitation, chip, what happens is you are interested in a particular protein, either a transcription factor, so non-histone, or a histone with particular modification. What you do is you cross-link the, the chromatin, the DNA as it exists and its association with, with other proteins, and then you shear the DNA in some way. So you end up with just small pieces of DNA, maybe 200 base pairs, 300 in length, um, and then you are able to pull down the component of that DNA that has the, the transcription factor or the modified histone of your interest in it. Um, and then you can purify the DNA, decrosslink, and you end up with just naked DNA that's associated with whatever protein you're interested in. So you can do all this, and then you can use Illumina sequencing, and which will give you lots and lots of very short reads describing uh, where either one end or the other end of these pieces of DNA are. So if there's a particular chip analyte you're interested in, it might give rise to a bunch of, bunch of little pieces of DNA that overlap it, and if you sequence the ends of these, you'll get a bunch of little tags, which I've de designated by this, these arrows. So the simplest possible way to represent this data is to just do a density map, where you, know, where you have more tags, you add on more, and then you add on more, you know, and then you go away. So if you did that here, you actually wouldn't get a good view of what's going on in the genome, because you have peaks, 
on either side of where your analyte actually is. So if you want to, this data, since it's all done with sequencing, is, is inherently uh, very high resolution. And if you want to be able to actually use the full resolution, you need to be a little more careful about the way you transform the sequencing reads back into some sort of signal. So we use a, a tool called Wiggler, which was developed by um, Anshul Kundaja, who's out at Stanford. Um, and it does all of these things very correctly, very carefully and correctly, um, where you will get something from a bunch of tags like this. You'll get extension of the tags only in the strand direction, and you'll end up with a nice curve with a peak right over the analyte that you're interested in. And if you run Wiggler, you will get data that looks like this. So here's a 300 base pair segment of the genome on the x-axis here. And on the y-axis, we have um, six different transcription factors and two different histone modifications. Each one of those, with any, its y-axis, um, it designates the amount of signal you have at that position. So signal is here is defined as a, a function of the number of extended bases overlapping a particular position. So you do the tags, you sequence the tags, you extend them by a certain amount, and you, you calculate how many overlap a particular position. You get something like this. So even if you're looking fairly finely in the, the genome, like at this 300 base pair window, you can see some fine structure. So you can see that these histone modifications are peaking over here, and then there's this nucleosome free region, presumably, in here, where you have peaks for various transcription factors with their summits of various, various different places. So lots of really, really fine resolution data that you can get your hands on. So you can get your hands on all this stuff. All this stuff is, is, is public. There are lots and lots of experiments that you can use, 25 different assay types, more than 150 different cell types, although as I, I mentioned, a lot of the stuff was coordinated in about six different cell types. You can find a lot more data for those. Um, and some time ago, there were more than 200 chip seek analyses. That was several months ago. Now there are probably more like 250. All in all, there are more than 2,700 data sets today. Um, and the question is, once you get all of those data sets, now what do you do? So a lot of what people were doing in the initial, initial parts of the ENCODE project of the production phase, we're looking at things at a track-by-track -track basis, but we wanted to um, use the, the power of a joint analysis on all, of, on all of this data, where we could look, see what sort of patterns we could learn from looking at multiple experiments simultaneously. And that is the technique of semi-automated genomic annotation, which I'm going to explain to you now. So semi-automated genomic annotation, you start with a series of signal tracks, and then you do pattern discovery. And when you discover the patterns, you can use them to annotate the genome. You can use them to visualize really complex multivariate data in a simple, human understandable way. And you can use it to help interpret bits of the genome. Say if you have a, um, a SNP that you know is associated with some sort of disease you're interested in, and you want to know what its molecular role is, you can use something like, like this tool uh, to, to help you figure out what is going on there. So I'm going to show you how this technique works through a cartoon process first, and then we'll, we'll get more into the details of after that. So we do this annotation through a process of genomic segmentation. I'm going to show you three different example tracks that I, I drew by hand, not real data. So along the x-axis, again, is position along a chromosome, and y-axis is the signal, which is a function of the, the number of um, cells in a population that show some sort of activity, whether that's the presence of a protein or the presence of a hypersensitive site or a plant. So in genomic segmentation, you partition the genome completely into non-overlapping segments, and you assign each one of these segments a label from a finite set, and then you change around the identities of the labels and the positions of the boundaries such that you can maximize the similarities between segments of the same label. So you can see here we have a segment with a zero label, and it has this low, high, low pattern, and here's one label with a high, low, high pattern, and you can have several other 
patterns like that. This is a method for seeing what sort of patterns recur in the data. And you, you can find not just high and low, but you can also find medium, medium high, medium low, you know, whatever, whatever you want. Are there any questions about this? Okay. So now I'm going to get into a little of, of how this is implemented. So we implement this using a Bayesian network. And I'm going to start with a very the, the simplest sort of Bayesian network I could think of for this sort of technique. Um, and then expand into the full basic network that we use. So if you're looking at the results of one experiment after processing with something like Wiggler, you end up with a number at every position. So that number signal uh, you can represent with this, this circle here. So it's just a number. It doesn't, you know, you don't know what the number means a priori. It's just bigger or lower or something. What you really want to know is not this number, but you want to know if you're doing transcription factor tip C. The answer to the question, is there a transcription factor present here or not? So all this data comes from a big population of cells, and within that population of cells, in some in one cell, you know, in some cells it'll be present, in some cells it won't be present. But in any given cell, it'll either be there or it won't be there. And you can answer this binary question in the form of probability. So the binary question is one, it's present, and zero is the answer when it's not present. And so you can, you can figure out the probability that this value is 0 or 1. That's really the question you want to answer. <coughs> These two values, of course, are related. So you can um, infer the value of the hidden variable based on what you've observed, which is the, the signal. And in a Bayesian network, is just a, essentially a modeling language which allows you to say that this, this variable, this observed variable, is dependent on the value of this. So the probability that you will have one you'll have one probability distribution here if this value is zero, and you might represent that by a Gaussian, in fact we do, and another one if it's one. So there's actually a transcription factor present, you're going to see much higher signal levels. So Bayesian network, that's just one position. That's like base pair 384. Probably also want to look at base pair 385. You can copy the same part of the model over again. There's one other piece of the, the puzzle that you should add in, which is that these two things are connected. It's very unlikely that you're gonna get a transcri transcription factor that's only present at, at one position, and it's not present at the base pair before or after. So you can add this into the model to say that the, the value of this hidden variable, whether the transcription factor is present or not, is dependent greatly on the previous variable. So if it's high, if there's if it's present in the previous variable, it's very likely it'll be present in the next variable. So this is for two positions of the genome, this, this conventional Bayesian network. And what we can do using a dynamic Bayesian network, or DBN, is we can use this as a template and we can copy or enroll it down the entire the arm of the chromosome. So you can go from this to something with millions of different base pairs, millions of frames, and use the same inference algorithms to, to cover all of this. And then you can infer the values of all these variables. So in the end, you've got an idea of uh, whether this transcription factor is present or not, which is great. You could have used a peak caller for that. Probably would have been better anyway. Um, and some of you, any of you know what this particular kind of dynamic Bayesian network is called? Anyone? I know some of you. Yes, yeah, so this is a hidden markup model. Um, so this is a, a different way of describing hidden Markov model than is often used in the bioinformatics literature, but this is something that's quite often used in the, the graphical model and machine learning literature. So let's go beyond that simple, simple hidden Markov model to a dynamic Bayesian network that's designed for the segmentation process I told you about early, earlier. So instead of just having one observed variable, we can have three or n, n or m, as many as we want. So we might have um, include observations for DNAs1, for a particular histone modification, for CTCF finding. We're going to throw out all of the binarization I told you about before. So, so none of that is happening. Instead, we can represent each one of these by the real numbers that, that come out of whatever is producing your signal, something like Wiggler or something similar. And this hidden variable, instead of being an on and off, present or absent kind of thing, Instead, we are going to replace it with, with this category or segment label. You can call it a label, or you can call it a state, or you can call it a category. People call it all sorts of different things. I like calling it 
a label. So this might have 25 different values or 100 different values, and each one of those is going to describe a different pattern and a, uh, essentially a multivariate probability distribution that describes all of these, these observed variables. So you've got that. But if you're doing this at one base pair resolution, you have to contend with the fact that there is missing data. Uh, if you're using a much lower, dis lower resolution, you can downsample or you can smooth the data somehow. But here at one base pair resolution, you can see there are a lot of places where, say, you can't get a unique sequencing tag. So you don't really know what the signal is at those positions. And it is, in my view, incorrect to say, since you don't know at zero, really what it is is you don't know. So you don't want you know, somewhere where you don't know disrupting the patterns you're discovering or identifying because you're saying it's zero and it's really not. So the way we deal with this in, in, um, in this method is by adding an additional indicator variable that tells you whether data is present or absent. So if data is present in a particular base pair for an experiment, this is one. If it's absent, these are variable to zero. And the model is set up so that when this is zero, that, that connection between the hidden variable and the observed variable here is essentially erased. So you remove that from the model, and in fact, you marginalize it for all possible values of whatever the unknown um, observed variable is. So this is for one, one experiment. You can reproduce that apparatus and have it for every single experiment for every frame in the genome. And the final thing that we're going to use to um, extend this, this DVN, so it's a little more complex than HMM, is a particular apparatus up here um, which controls the length distribution. So a hidden Markov model, a vanilla hidden Markov model will give you a length distribution of staying, staying in a particular state um, that, that corresponds to a geometric distribution. But if you use something like this, and I'm not going to explain how this works in detail here, but we can talk about it over pizza if you want, you can do things like set minimum segment lengths or maximum segment lengths or set various prior time. And all these things become very important in using the, the kind of data that, that we're using. This didn't work until I added that stuff in. So all of this together um, is packaged in a tool called, called Segway uh, because it is a way to segment the genome. Are there, are there any questions? So now we can talk about the application of segue to the data in the ENCODE project. So I'm going to start by talking about this chronic myeloid leukemia cell line, K562, and then I'll, I'll throw in some, some results from some of these other so-called tier 1 and 2 cell types. So we did an experiment segue where we took 49 different tracks of ENCODE K562 data. So chip seat, DNA seq and ferro seq, which again is something similar to, to DNA in terms of uh, what sort of meaning we get out of it, came from eight different labs and the ENCODE project. And we told Segway that it should find 25 different patterns within this. So this is something you have to set off for your and this is a very important question, which is how many, how many labels do you, do, you, do you tell the method to, uh, to pick? So, you know, there are things like BIC or AIC that will, that will tell you, you know, essentially how many variables you can statistically support without worrying about overfitting. Um, in this case, there's a lot of data. We've got literally billions times, times hundreds of, of data points. And so overfitting uh, does not become much of a problem. And so the penalties that are applied by these things are insufficient to get the sorts of results we want which are for visualizing things for humans. They're, they're for human understanding the data. So you know, we ended up kind of empirically trying a different number, small number of labels. And you know, we found various patterns in 25 that we didn't find in 12, but we didn't really find any new patterns. We looked at four years ago. So I don't know how to do that empirically. So we picked 25 labels. We told Segway to find 25 labels. And this is what it found. So, it created, so this heat map is a representation of all of the parameters that Segway learns. So if you remember, each one of those, those experiments, uh, observed variables for the experiments, um, multiplied by each one of the possible state values, so each one of the possible hidden variable values 
is associated with a particular galaxy. Okay? And this heat map, the colors show all of the means of those Gaussians that are representing various parts of this model. So for each row represents a particular observed experiment. And you can go, say, down the bottom row is CTCF and the K562 from the scan lab. And then along here, you can see the values associated with different patterns. So there's this one pattern, 19, which is associated with really high values of CTCF. And there's another value, zero, which is associated with low values. You can see just by doing the hierarchical clustering of the parameters that come out, you can already see some amount of, some amount of structure in these sorts of parameters. But all these numbers aren't very, very useful uh, to a human trying to interpret stuff. So remember how I said this was semi-automated annotation. Up to here, it's mostly been automated. But the semi part is that here, a human has to come in and assign meaning to each one of these labels. And so each one of the, the labels can kind of represent a hypothesis. And so I assign kind of mnemonic labels, letters that describe what each one of these is doing. And you know, starting with, with this map and my knowledge of chromatin biology, and then testing it by testing those hypotheses by both looking at individual positions and also running laboratory experiments with our collectors. So some of the patterns we see are things associated with transcription start sites, um, gene starts, so just a little further three primes to the gene, gene middles, gene ends, uh, distal enhancers, distal CTCF elements, polycom repressed regions of the genome, and um, this is something that, that no one really expected, I think, before then, these sort of dead regions of the genome. We're in a particular cell type, so the things on the left are dead. You get very little activity from any of these assays in that one cell type. Uh, it's not like a, it's not a sequencing artifact, because in other cell, cell types you can often find um, activity there, just in one cell type they will be dead. Um, if you're looking for this in the ENCODE papers, I'll, I'll point out that some of the, the other collaborators did not like the term dead. So in the paper, these are instead referred to as quiescent. So just, just quiescent, about just, about <laughs> just about dead. They're quiet, they're, they're sleeping. Maybe you should call them sleeping, that would be fun. Okay, so after identifying these patterns and kind of you know, coming up with the first crack of the hypotheses of, of what they correspond to, um, we can then map them back to the, the genome. So here's a, a screenshot from the UCSC genome browser, two kilobase regions of the genome along the x-axis, and each one of these, these regions, these, these tracks in the plot, shows the original signal value used to produce this, this segmentation, this pattern discovery. So here we've got a histone modification, four different histone modifications, here we've got signal, from DNA hypersensitivity. And so you can see right here that essentially this DNA hypersensitive region with these two nucleosome-associated peaks on either side. Up here you can see all the gene models from the gen code annotations. So you can see that those histone, those nucleosomes are associated with genes running in opposite directions. So this, this whole region is a bidirectional promoter, basically. And up here, you can see the segue annotation for this, this region. So it breaks down not just what was in these tracks, but also in several other tracks that would be quite difficult to um, look at all at once um, and assigns discrete labels to everything. So this, this hypersensitive region it calls regulatory, and on either side is this TSS flanking, and there's promoter flanking beyond that, and on either side of that, there's things that look like it could be enhancers or promoters. This is the sort of identification you can do, you know, assigning the labels to the genome after you do the initial pattern discovery. Um, so you can also look at much bigger regions of the genome. So one thing that we found is that this method could essentially rediscover genes uh, without using any of the sorts of data traditionally used to find genes. So there's no RNA data, no comparative data, no, no sequence data at all, just by looking at the signal from these various um, chromatin measurements, you could find this gene corresponding to this, this TSS followed by gene start, followed by gene end pattern, and you can find this here, and you can find the same thing here. You find the same sort of pattern, TSS, gene start, gene end, all throughout the genome. Zoom out here, the same region, so this is a 400 kb region 
across. And you can see that the TF side segments occur mainly near the fire prime ends of the genes, and the repressed and dead segments occur mainly in the gene deserts, um, and that the TSS and gene segments are, are missing from the gene deserts. And you know, it's, you don't just see these things anecdotally. You know, you can also see it in aggregate across the, the whole genome, which um, I think I probably don't have time to present that, but it's in all the papers. Um, one other thing we found that was interesting was a particular pattern associated with the three prime ends of genes. So um, you could find this very interesting pattern um, on either side, actually, of the annotated three prime end of the genes. So you know, my interpretation of this is there's some sort of persistent nucleosome pattern often occurring in three prime ends. So one other thing that we, we looked at, so you know, I was looking at various regions of the genome and came across this area, which is very rich in genes, um, but very few of these TSS and gene start segments that mark genes very well in the rest of the genome. And so the question is why? Um, and then we realize it's because those genes aren't actually expressed in the cell type. So really what this is, is a method of, of finding not just genes, but genes that are expressed in a particular cell type that you're looking at, which makes sense, but you know, it's something that, that people have to think about sometimes differently. The, the genome, not as a, a single entity for all humans, it's something that differs by cell type. We decided to see whether we could use this to actually find sequences that were in and of themselves predictive of transcription in a particular cell type. And so we, I, I don't do wet lab experiments anymore. Um, and neither did anyone in the lab I was in, so we actually hired a company to do um, some luciferase assays for us, so we did a bunch of predictions. We took a bunch of TSS-associated regions and predicted some of them that we expected expression in K562, and some of them that we didn't necessarily have cause to think that. Um, results are shown, shown here, so positive predictions are in this column and this column. 100% of the positive predictions showed expression in this this assay, and a majority of the negative predictions did not show any expression either. Um, some of the, a few of them did, um, even though the overall level of expression is a lot lower, and so what's happening there is that, um, that the repression must be caused by um, surrounding, surrounding regions in the content. Something else is bringing the repression there rather than those particular sequences themselves. So I also mentioned in answers, is this can you guys see that? Can we turn off the light a little? So um, we also did a number of, of enhancer predictions using this and um, got people in um, Jochen Wickbrook's lab in Heidelberg. I should have, I should have more English to support. Um, he, um, he, he did some transgenic Madaka fish assays for us where, where he put sequences that we predicted as having enhancer qualities um, next to a GFP reporter. And remember all this stuff I showed you was in K562, which is a, a human, uh, it's, it's associated with a red blood cell lineage in human. So human red blood cells don't have nuclei, but in Mandaka fish they do. And so what you're actually seeing here, pulsing around, are actual nucleated red blood cells in the Mandaka fish um, that are expressing this, this GFP tag. So that's actually the blood moving around. There are a variety of other ways that, that people um, tested the enhancer prediction. So lymph inoculus group did some, some tests in, in mice. You know, the majority of them had, wasn't so, you know, 53% is not especially exciting. But what was exciting to me is that, that using, um, you know, unsupervised graphical models like Segway um, did a lot better um, than some of the other methods that were picked. So uh, I think, there was a lot of overlap with some of the discriminative machine learning techniques that were also tested with the ENCODE project. Um, so I don't think there's a statistically significant difference there. There's definitely a difference with just random background and a big difference uh, between our sorts of method and either doing a prediction just based on transcription factor binding set predictions <clears throat> or a little um, scenario where we had expert biologists um, look at the data and uh, pick what they thought were enhancers. Um, so, you know, the machine learning technique was a lot better than our, our human uh, gold standard um, at picking that sort of thing. So that was kind of exciting to me. Uh, so, 
So there's a lot of other crumbs and stuff I could talk about, but um, in the interest of, of trying to get you guys to pizza earlier, I'm going to skip to some of the, the newer work, which is on RNA-seq. So we wanted to um, apply this sort of data to the encode RNA <coughs> methods to encode RNA-seq data. Um, and the thing about RNA-seq is that it produces stranded information. So the chromatin data, the chip-seq and DNA-seq, even though the tags are stranded, they essentially transform into unstranded, unstranded signal. Not so with the RNA seq, where where you know information on coming from one strand versus another is very important for the final interpretation. So we ended up come up with a way to incorporate this into our model, um, and what we ended up doing was just taking the same dynamic Bayesian network and copying it and running it in reverse across the RNA seq. Um, signal. So doing something like this um, allows us to tie all of the parameters between the plus and the minus strand of the RNA seq data. So we just learn, um, you know, one one set of parameters, and um, I think it works quite well. So the, the encode RNA seq data is not just RNA seq for a particular cell type. There are actually um, you know, many different RNA seq experiments for a cell type. Some, some of them with side selection for short RNAs, for long RNAs, and then various sorts of cellular subcompartments are selected for. So you might, they've done experiments where they've looked only at RNAs that are in the nucleus, or RNAs that are found in the cytosol, or RNAs that are associated with the nucleolus. And so we were able to look at 14 different tracks for, say, K562, and to try to do a segue unsupervised pattern discovery on those as well. So I picked 25 labels for, for a similar reason as before. And we end up with a, a pattern uh, that's somewhat like this. And this is this is all kind of unpublished work, so maybe you shouldn't tweet this part. I'm not tweeting. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, so this is the sort of thing we've done. This is a much earlier stage. So all of the stuff with those labels that I talked about before was actually through several levels of an iteration of describing things and looking at the hypotheses and going back and changing. We're at a much earlier stage here where we're simply describing what the various sorts of patterns are associated with. So, you know, some of them are associated, um, you know, mainly with long RNA-seq or some mainly with short RNA-seq and there are various other sorts of patterns like SC1, which is associated with short RNA-seq in cytosol, but long RNA-seq in <coughs> the nucleus, which is, which is quite strange. Uh, but the key thing here is that you can, you know, it allows you to collapse what is 28 tracks of signal to something that is, is much simpler to look at. Um, and there are also three quiescent states that all, all in all take more than 80% of the genome. So the bulk of it is, is quiescent. There's only a few things interesting about it. So here we're looking at a much bigger region of the genome, more than 400 kb long. Uh, I think that because there are four different genes on it that are on two different strands. And here you can see the original 28 data tracks um, that gave rise to the segmentation. And so using this site RNA, which is what I call the RNA version of this, um, you can see all 25 of the different patterns and thick bars wherever the pattern is actually present. So you see this, this you know, characteristic pattern around the genes where you find certain labels associated with exons, and you find some other labels that are associated mainly with, with introns, and then um, you know, find a lot of quiescent stuff on the plus strand when there are no genes on the, on the plus strand. And if you do the same sort of thing with the minus strand data, you end up with, with kind of a mirror image of the same. But one other thing that we noticed that um, I didn't particularly know about before um, was, and I don't know how much this has been published about, but certainly aren't any people know about, is that often there is antisense transcription. So you can see short, sorry, you can see um, short RNA-seq here where there's a gene on the plus strand. So, so sorry, gene on the minus strand. So the gene on the minus strand here, the short RNA-seq pattern strand on the, the plus strand. And so this was the sort of Thing that came out of this that we were able to see that we never really noticed by, by looking at the um, individual data. Um, I'm going to, to sum up here. 
Um, so semi-automated uh, genome annotation is something that starts with pattern discovery and lets us visualize very complex data, annotate it, and, and do interpretation of variants. Um, all of the software that I've talked about today is available. Um, there are links from my, from my website, um, or you can just Google them. I'm going to talk just very briefly about my plan for my lab in general. So not, not in much detail, but just sort of you know, what I want to do uh, um, over the next 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 years or sort of first five um, is be part of you know, figuring out how, how do we actually read this book. I think this has been a big challenge for, for a long time you know, to treat the genome as some sort of black box where you, know, where you can take sequence and, and figure out what sort of phenotype is, is coming out of it. And I think now that we have much more experimental data at, at what I'm calling sort of intermediate states of the genome, so you have data um, on what sort of epigenetic modifications are occurring, on what nucleosome structure looks like, about which transcription factors occur where, the, the problem of trying to, to model how you get some sort of output from the, the input that is the, the DNA sequence itself um, starts becoming much simpler. And I think you know, as this, this goes on, we're going to get you know, closer and closer to you know, what I want to do, which is to start with this and be able to uh, just the sequence and some other information we know about the system and be able to do a really good job of predicting what sort of RNA um, is expressed or you know, what happens when you perturb the system in various ways, what sort of RNA is will happen. Of course, RNA is just the first step in trying to figure out what the organismal phenotype is of various genetic changes. Uh, but I think it's a very important first step, and I'm happy to focus on this, this part of things. I think that will uh, keep us all occupied. So I want to thank uh, a number of people, uh, people, my, my um, co-mentors at the University of Washington, some people I work with here. It's Orion here. Orion is a, uh, is a um, PhD student at the University of Toronto now, although he was at the University of Washington beforehand. Uh, the ENCODE project, thank NIH um, for paying for all of this. And lastly, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Question is what you know? What's really going on with these dead regions, basically? So you know, these here are simply an observation that um, that there's no signal in these various sorts of assays. The model that most people have to explain this is that yes, they are densely packed. You know, that's you know my my best bet is that they are they have heterochromatin and that they are not accessible to these various assays, and that's why you see them. You know repeatedly not producing any, any signal in them. I don't know how much people have actually um, interrogated that particular assumption in detail. Yes? Uh, so you take all these data and you make code, and then you produce the 25 states. Uh, do you have a way to know which of these tracks are the most important ones? Because that yeah. was a lot of experiments. Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of a, a feature selection question. Um, you know, after working with this data for, for uh, a long period of time, I have a pretty good, a pretty good idea of which tracks I think are, um, are most important here. Um, you know, so for example, you can see things like, where is H4K20 one Okay, here's that, we did a lot of H4K20 one that never really told me anything interesting. Like, you know, it was something that I could throw out in many experiments, and like I would still get basically the same results. All of these different transcription factors shown here, you can throw almost all of them out and get very similar results. Um, so, you, so the sort of diversity in these results are dominated by the, the histone modifications and by CTCF and Paul II. Um, so a lot of what you can do if you want to do it kind of a um, you know, sloppy way is just to you know look at this this map and see you know what sort of rows you see patterns essentially look like they're repeating so kind of meta patterns that are repeating 
those things might be redundant with each other when looking at the data in this way. If you want to do it more carefully, if there's, you know, if you're if you're interested in a particular question like finding enhancers or finding transcription start sites, yeah. you can also run segue in a semi-supervised mode um, instead, um, where you can look specifically at those questions and then you can see how well your performance does when you when you add in or throw out various sorts of things. Uh, <coughs> questions? I have did you find any um, interesting examples with the different um, types of RNA experiments? I haven't looked into that in detail. For example, are the antisense ones more likely to be nuclear, for example, or do you think any sort of unexpected uh, results from specific experiments? Yes, I wish I could say that I, I had delved more deeply into it, you know, deeply enough in the RNA seq uh, data to to know the answer to those questions, but I haven't. So that stuff is is still pretty. Um, you know, new and uh, is still need to explore it a lot more. Yes? So a couple of questions. One, uh, so you said Segway was really good for finding genes. And so how, if you compare it to the known gene set, RefSeq or whatever, do you find, do you find errors in the ones that have been put there? Because Segway says there shouldn't be genes, or do you find new genes that were totally missed beforehand? Yeah, that's a good question. So that's something that we've been working on is, so all of this stuff I showed you is unsupervised. We also have this, this semi-supervised mode. Um, and we've been working on, on trying to you know, come up with a, a model that is explicitly designed to predict genes. Um, and after doing that, you know, then that's the sort of question that you would, we would look at. But, you know, the unsupervised thing is just kind of, you know, first pass approximation of, you know, what a particular bit of the genome means and not necessarily something that a lot of statistical support to claim, like, this is a gene, even though RefSeq says that it, it isn't. Um, and the other thing, RefSeq can't tell you, you know, which, which genes are going to be on necessarily oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in K562 yeah. versus which ones will be on in gene 78 So they kind of answer related. Any, um, and your seg RNA, where you have 14 different RNA seq tracks, are those really comparable? I mean, those are all different techniques that have different sort of. Uh, yeah. Can you, can you compare them basically from within uh, the same the different experiments between within the same cell type? I mean, are they? Yeah, I think so. I mean, so so essentially, we have here we have three different techniques. So I, I would say within each one of these techniques, there are six different cell, cellular compartments. I would say those are absolutely okay, so, comparable. So then between the three, can right, you? Right, so. right. So I'm cage is, is totally different. And, and if you'll notice here, the cage did not really form any sort of yeah. interesting combinatorial patterns with the rest of the stuff. So actually, um, you know, I'm planning to redo all of this, and we're not going to make the presentation on this one. Okay. Uh, but as far as the other two things, um, you know, with the chromatin stuff, we used very different methods as well, and things that were that were sometimes treated and processed very differently by very different labs, and we found very similar results. I think the method is very robust to um, sort of small changes in, in you know the function between um, you know the original sequences and sorry the original like biological phenomenon and whatever kind of signal. You get so I'm not I'm not too worried about that question, but it is something that's worth being you know it's worth trying to normalize things carefully. So one of the uh, as you put to both speakers today, so one of the big things that came out when the ENCODE papers came out was this whole controversy about 80 percent of the genome was doing something. Yeah. And so what, what's your what are your thoughts? On that? <laughs> uh, I can tell I love I love getting this question. So yeah, so here's the the the, the masthead encode paper in nature September, and the abstract says you know these data enabled us to assign biochemical functions for 80 percent of the the genome. They say biochemical functions. Um, 
And what the, value of biochemical function? Well, that's what this answer is. What is the biochemical function? Okay, and so they, they say, we define a functional element as something that encodes a defined product or displays a, a reproducible biochemical signature. And the vast majority of the genome participates in at least one of these, these biochemical or chromatin associated events and at least one cell type. So, you know, I think that the paper was quite clear about what they were talking about. And I think these statements are, are quite clearly, you know, correct according to this data. You can definitely observe this sort of specific activity across 80% of the genome. Okay? I think, you know, a lot of, there are different sorts of ways of measuring function, right? There's like, there's evolutionary function and then there's kind of a genetic function like you can, you can say that something, you know, people have been in labs for, for decades of years and saying that things are functional by like, you know, doing a knockout of something or recently doing a knockdown and saying, oh, this, this gives rise to a big phenotype. Um, and they say that whatever they knocked out was functional due to that. And that's a different sort of thing than sorts of function that you can prove by showing signatures of positive or purifying selection. And I think this sort of biochemical function um, you know, I think is well defined as a, a third sort of, of way of looking at function. And the paper was also also very clear that this was not the same thing as looking at, at you know function from a evolutionary selection point of view. You know, and that you know areas under the purifying selection, the input paper estimates three to eight percent biochemical function, they estimate eighty point four percent. Where we got in Trouble, I think, is a lot of the um, the press around this was all in terms of you know, conflating. I think these three different concepts, and you know, sometimes you can really blame the, the you know the journalists for this. And I would not do that here because I think we um, should have been more careful about the way we portrayed things to the journalists and you know, the way statements were made outside this paper. Um, so I think that's, you know. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my feeling. I think, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think, you know, I think this is very defensible. I just wanted to stir the pot a little bit. Oh, thanks, thanks, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes. So you were talking about how you've got the cell lines you actually used in your food project. And I'm wondering if you have any sense of how much it's going to screw you up that the epigenetic environment of individual living human cells of peptidin culture is different from the ones you have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. that's a really good. That's a really good question. Um, but it's a horrible question too, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a horrible, horrible question to answer. It's hard to tell. tell. It is. It is very hard to tell. Um, you know, a lot of this. So you know, big. A big component of the Encode project was, was essentially technology development, and there are you know all sorts of different aspects of this this problem of trying to figure out everything we can about the biochemical activity of the genome. And the decision was made to focus on these particular uh, cancer cell types because they're a lot more tractable, and you know people had their hands full um, just trying to get the chip seat to work. Trying to you know figure out RNA seq, trying to figure out how to get all the analysis to work. Um, so it was one less thing that they didn't want to have to worry about. In the third phase of Encode, um, a lot more of the things are going to be done off of um, you know off of primary primary tissue rather than cancerous cell types. Um, so there's that. If you want to get you know, it's always hard with humans to do those you know ethics ethics problems of you know. Uh, harmfully experimenting on, on live people. But there are things like GTEx, which is a project um, that the NIH is sponsoring to try to, to do lots of RNA-seq in different tissues of people who are very, very soon after death. Um, so that's something, you know, that is something that I think will give us the best picture of what the, um, you know, the, the, the gene regulatory state of uh, real human cells are in vivo is something like GTEx. And unfortunately, they don't have any chip in there as far as I know. It's all, it's all RNA seed. So there's that, and then there are the mouse experiments you can do. And there's a big mouse encode uh, part as well. But yeah, it's, it's, 
it's really hard, and uh, you know we don't have a we don't have a good answer um, for for that. Even the primary cells, you can affect, expect artifacts due to the, to the um, being in you know tissue at all and not plucked out of someone's body. So. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you very much. And please join me and thank you, Michael, again. Thank you.